Hello everyone, welcome to the Hue virtual chat. It is a glorious Tuesday and yes, we are still in our third lockdown. We have so much to talk about though. We're going to be talking about pronouns. Remember that from grammar school? Well, I think we're going to learn another lesson. So let's bring in our lovely guests. There's Kirsten. Hello. Hello, Robin. Hey, love the shirt. Like that. Hi, Linda. Oh, good to see you, Susie. And hello, Cynthia. Good to see all of you. Big hugs, hugs and kisses again, virtually. Ah. <laughs> I know. Okay, so you can unmute yourselves. Um, we're going to get right down to it. I had a well, actually, you know what, uh, Susie, I saw your post on Instagram um, on pronouns and how Instagram was using them and everything like that. And it got me thinking about, yes, I have been seeing a lot of, you know, um, she, her, he, him after people's signatures. And it got me thinking about, yes, it is really, truly, I guess, part of our identity and uh, so I want you to start off today, Susie, and, um, you know, educate s some of us that aren't aware and uh, maybe, you know, teach us on how to understand more about all of this. Well, my post was mostly from a social media perspective, mm -hmm. not um, not speaking from the point of, uh, of lived experience of needing to um, assure people of how I wish to be uh, presented or addressed. But my post was more about um, that this is an important step, not just for social media, actually, mm -hmm. but I really think that it's important to have um, on business cards, in your email signatures, on your LinkedIn profiles, any way that, um, especially now that we're meeting over Zoom and things like that, we're not necessarily having these face-to-face -face, uh, connections and um, there's a piece of our interaction uh, history as humans that's missing, right? So I think it's really important. And this also goes back to a couple of weeks ago, um, I believe it was Ian McCausland, uh, posted something or shared something about um, people with difficult or long names and mm -hmm. not uh, not wanting to put upon other people the um, the onus of pronouncing that name properly or whatever mm -hmm. that might be. And I think that it's really important, especially now in 2021 and, you know, as we move forward, it's really important to learn how to address people in the way that they wish to be addressed. And so when I meet somebody new uh, and they say their name to me, I will sometimes ask them to say it again and maybe even slower just so I can make sure that I'm hearing them properly. Sometimes I do struggle with hearing, especially over Zoom and things like that. Make sure that I'm saying it properly. And I'll say it back to them. And, um, and then ask for, you know, a card or their uh, it, it written down, you know, so that I can make sure if I have to reconnect with them, you know, via email or phone, whatever, I make sure I'm saying it right. It seems like such a, such a simple thing to do, but I think that there's a lot of people, especially racialized people, who have changed their names, who have shortened their names, who have adopted Canadian or white names to make it easier for other people to say their names and I'm here to say I don't like that anymore I want you to own the name that you want and to tell me how you wish to be addressed and I am going to do my best to honor that and say it properly it's the same thing with pronouns I think it's so much easier if you tell people how you would like to be addressed and if we make it commonplace it becomes a courtesy and not uh, and not something that is meant to out people or meant to be a surprise or anything like that. It's just a common courtesy. And it's a civility that we can offer each other that lends grace and kindness into an introduction or an interaction. Wow. I mean, that's, and, yeah, and you're so right. I mean, <laughs> Linda, do you want to, who's got a finger? Oh, yo, oh sorry. No, no, okay, go, right, go ahead, Robin. Go ahead. Yeah. And a quick question for Susie. Was it you who had written in your post as well about the privilege of? Yes. yes. Okay, because I just noticed that. I When you started talking, and Tracy, when you asked that question, so I quickly changed my, my pronoun, like added my pronouns in there, she, her, right? And as you were talking, I realized in that moment how much of a privilege that was. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to wonder what the repercussions were. Absolutely. I so to me that was that was a moment right there. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. 
Absolutely. Totally. And, and I, I don't need to hold any more space in this conversation, but I can certainly pass it to Cynthia and Robin, who have lived experience and can speak to what this is like, for sure. Okay, Robin. <laughs> I just want to say pronouns are not important to everyone. And so although, like, it's this piece about, you know, I heard that maybe we should. Like, I would put, I don't give a shit. Right, so that's what I would put on my name because can you add that to your Zoom profile? That'd be fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> because, like for me, I actually don't care, and I know it's super important to to some people. Um, and you know, I have friends that call me she. I have friends that call me he. I have friends that call me they. And like, I I think one of the things is we have to be really cautious about like do we blanket this and say everyone should do this and and i get the premise behind hey putting it out there but i also want to have individuals that have the choice to not put it out there if they don't care and so i think there's an important conversation in that um and and i linda i really get the privilege piece right because you know I'd probably pick more masculine pronouns if I was going to go for it. And then people look at me and they're like, oh, yeah. Mm, 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 mm. Um, but, it, but it is the place where I really want us to be cognizant about do we then shame people who don't put it up there? Now, some people might put it up there because they're dickheads. Sorry, Tracy, I'm in this mood today. <laughs> but some people might put it up there because it doesn't matter to them what people say. And so I think we have to be cautious of that piece too. And maybe that will change for me in the future because I've always said I'm a hybrid, right? Boy brain, thank you, Kirsten and Charlotte for interpreting. Um, girl body at the moment, no. And Cynthia, Cynthia helps me out too quite a lot. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I, I, I just think there's a place about being politically correct for politically correct sake and allowing people to express their individuality, which I know Susie is totally you. Like, I love the stuff that you say, but I was like, whoa, not everyone should have to. That's my two pieces. I'll be quiet now. Well, thank you, Tracy. Uh, no, but I, I so I want to ask you, Robin. I mean, because you, so I'm sitting here a little uh, confused too, because, okay, because you're so open and, like you said, it, you don't give up. Mm -hmm. I can't say that, say that but. Uh, <laughs> say it. <laughs> um, but. Um, but there are others that it really matters. And if I make the mistake of thinking, oh, well, you know, I, I go, you know, so I guess that's where I wanted to talk about this and what is, I guess, and I hate the politically correct or the proper way or, and I guess now with the pronouns, now that should be a clearer, you know, direction for you when you're addressing somebody. Um, so yeah, so what would you, like, how do we do work around that, right? I mean, I guess it's just going to be a conversation. I don't know, Susie? Well, I think, I think Robin makes a perfect point, right? Is that mm -hmm. so, so for example, I put it in my, my bio. I don't just do it for me, but I do it for people who maybe don't feel safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's my, that's my mode. That's my way of showing I'm a safe person to express Whoever you want to be to me. Mm -hmm. Again, that's my position. Not everybody's going to take that position. And I think, too, it also goes back to when I'm, when I'm asking you or I'm telling you my name is Susie and my pronouns are she and her, that's also an invitation for me to say, how would you like me to address you? And that's your opportunity to say, like Robin said, I don't care, or to say, you know, mine are such and such. Right, yeah. No, and I guess that's, you know, those conversations that are – we're going to have to start to have, and I'm going to go now to Cynthia because that's all about, um, you know, acceptance without understanding, right? Yeah, it is. Um, it, it's intriguing because I agree fundamentally with everyone, um, but 
You know, there's a couple of key things. First is it, it has to begin with acceptance. It begins with acceptance without understanding. Um, and Robin's right. Some people will choose to put in the pronouns, some won't. And sometimes the reason is that people don't want to use them is not that they don't care. It's that if they use them, they stand out. They're, they're mm -hmm. further isolated, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where allyship comes in because in an organization, especially in an organization that comes from the place that says, okay, you know, we'll do this. And if you don't need to do it, that's great. But, you know, that person needs to affirm their identity with, through their pronouns, then they go ahead. But if they're the only one that does it, they have just further marginalized themselves. And so allies that have the privilege to not have to do it by putting it in, as Susie was saying, you reaffirm your allyship in being able to support people. Mm -hmm. So that's really, you know, a key element of privilege is understanding you have privilege in using it. Mm -hmm. But the other part that no one spoke to is when you're not sure, which Susie was talking to with the idea of complex names, and I struggle with complex names, it, but I try, I, I, I definitely try my best to work it in and to ask how somebody, but at the end of the day, if you're not sure, just call me Cynthia. Like, <laughs> it, 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 it's um, whether you perceive it to be male or female or something else, the simple fact is, is I am Cynthia. You're not going to get it wrong if you just call me Cynthia, right? Um, and so really kind of figuring out the strategy that works. But I would say that if you're in a group, an organization, and they are, are adopting this process of allowing the identity. And again, I speak from coming from a corporate background where putting pronouns and emails was considered we're diverse enough. In other words, it was too much to ask for. So when organizations want to adopt and allow that, the whole idea that they can have allies that can support that so that they're not felt alone and isolated. Yeah. So that's, that's my a, two cents. That's an, go ahead, Susie. Yeah. Right, and I think that, you know, in, in my post, I basically said that I understand that I am steeped in privilege in the ability to put that out there because it's not, it's not, uh, there's no repercussions and there's no punishment for me doing that. And, and that, that makes me feel two ways. Like you said, you know, like I feel, I don't want to force anybody to do something they don't want to do or are not comfortable in doing yet. And yet I also want to signal to the larger community that I am okay with, with your expression, your, however you need to be and you want to be, I am there for that. So it's, it's, it's a challenge, I, I think, too, but I hope that we can come to a place where there's more acceptance, like you said, without understanding, and a place where people won't feel like like they're like they're not able to be who they are that's all that's the part that i that i don't want to be at anymore yeah kirsten oh this brings me back to a, a time when my now 23 year old was in high school and cynthia i love how you said just call me cynthia um because uh, my uh my julia was president of the gay straight alliance and she had this unbelievably awesome collective group of friends that spent a lot of time at our house and um, I wanted to be uh, incredibly respectful and make sure I used the right pronouns um, because for her, that was super important. And I mean, I would catch myself and I would, um, I was so conscious of it and I wasn't doing it justice. It just didn't come natural, especially the day I stumbled on at times. But honestly, everybody was honey and everybody was good with honey. And in my house, everybody was honey and, and uh, everybody was welcome. And that's just, I hope that doesn't sound silly, but. Still, there's still a couple of awesome uh, uh, young people that spent a lot of time at our house. And uh, honey, everybody's honey. And I just, that's my way of trying to uh, be so respectful, but also um, not, um, not, not fumbling and, and, uh, and uh, making anyone feel uncomfortable. I don't know, is that okay? I'm gonna ask <laughs> Cynthia and Robin, is that okay? You know what? It's okay if the people that you're with, if you ask them, mm -hmm. And they go, yeah, that's perfect, then great, right? Yeah. Um, and I found that with myself, my terms kind of change 
um, in groups, especially where I struggle with names or something. I have kind of an honorific that I refer to everyone, right? So, I mean, right now it's lately, it's lovely. Hi, lovely. How are you? So, yeah. Ah. Did you, did you <laughs> forget me? Is that why you called me lovely in the chat? <laughs> it's on here, my name. Um, Kirsten, I think that's absolutely it. Because if you called me honey, I would go like cringe. It's like dear. It's like <laughs> or love. Um, <laughs> okay, what if what if you're an older? What if what if you're like like 15, 16 years old, and you're uh, running out of my house and backyard, and I call you that? Put it in that context. <laughs> Look, I I just think Cynthia's right. As long as you check it out with the people that you're chatting to, um, I think that's the important thing. You know, I like, I use mate as an Aussie, mate, how's it going? And I know I was in a training once and I call lots of people buddy. And this guy flipped out in a training because his dad used to call him buddy in a derogatory way. And so I, th I think like we can get caught up on this. What's the right thing? And the right thing is, hey, someone's got a name or ask, mm -hmm. hey, you know, what do you like to be called? I'm cool with that. Like I go by Robin at work. I go by Rob in my personal life. I have friends in Australia and New Zealand that call me Robbie. So it really is just, hey, just ask or even ask about if, you know, pronouns. You can say, people ask me all the time, what, what pronoun do you like? And I go, no one gives you. Um, <laughs> No, and I say, but if you, you, you can use whichever one, like it's okay, but what do you like? So I make sure I'm respectful of you. I, I think we've forgotten the, the art of asking and checking out with the people because we're so concerned about, are we going to get it wrong? Oh, well, I mean, a good phrase that we use way too often, and Linda could probably attest to this too, like when you're talking or, or you know, and you're casual and you say, so what do you guys think? And you're talking to a whole bunch of women, but you, you say, and you say, "Hey, you guys." <laughs> I mean, oh. you can't. <laughs> and just, oh. <laughs> that was one thing I had to. I, 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 I think about two years ago, I became aware of that yeah. phrase, and I really had to be careful. Yeah, one in the I butt. know. <laughs> that yeah. Was, yeah, that totally. was not going to fly anymore. And so, you know, I think it's. I, you know what, I uh, like, I love this conversation. And the fact is, I think we can do hard things. I love that, you know, if I, I sometimes the, you know, when you're older, and you've got people around you who are, who are older, uh, the excuse for not changing is it's too hard. I've always done it this way, you know, how am I gonna, you know, possibly remember you know who goes by what and you know the reality is we can do hard things we can change we can you know we can as you said tracy we can make some mistakes mm -hmm. correct ourselves and move on with you know with without a blink you know we don't have to chastise ourselves if we mix up a pronoun you know apologize to the person use the 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 pronoun that they would like mm -hmm. and then keep going you yeah. know, and just that's it, it's not it's not rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Cynthia. Yeah. Yes, Tracy, yeah. I, I wanted to jump in on that because yeah. th this is actually a very specific example I teach and I'm going to do it in just a, a short moment here. So when a group of women are together and you hear guys, we've gotten so used to it being just part of speech that, you know, we don't really question it. Um, most women, at least when I'm together with a group of women, we don't feel it speaks to us. But, you know, there's a lot more generic terms that could be high folks, high everyone, mm -hmm. right, um, are some of the examples. Even the U.S. South have it correct with hi, y'all, <laughs> totally non-gender specific. But see, here's what happens to a transgender person when they hear that phrase. Like certainly a transgender woman is the first thing I ask is, was that just the colloquial speech 
or did I just get outed? And if I got outed, then my safety is called into question. Mm -hmm. And if my safety is called into question, then I immediately have to do a perimeter check to find out, am I in danger at any point? And the reason is, is that last year between Australia and the United States, over 33 men got away with murdering a transgender woman with what's called the transgender panic defense. That, oh, I was with her, I didn't realize, I panicked, I killed her, I'm sorry, and they got off scot-free. Most of those women were of Hispanic or black origin. So when I hear that phrase, my life is literally called into question in that split second. That's why you need to accept that high guys is not acceptable without having to understand because you will never, unless you live it, understand that experience. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm done. Wow. Well, thank you. Now you know you made it even, you know, put a whole new light onto that. But um, yeah, Susie, yeah, you'd gone for a little bit. Oh, Susan's joined us, but I was just talking on, you know, we used to say, well, you know, so what do you guys think? Or, you know, just that common kind of, and, and, and yes, and to put into perspective, Cynthia is just, you know, part of speech, but now it's, yeah, it's, uh, you know, with all what we've been talking about right now, it just, uh, it just, we need to just have, I guess, a more heightened awareness and, you know, and to ask those questions and to be polite. Hi, Sue, we're just joining us. We're talking about pronouns and uh, actually just a very, very, very hard discussion about, uh, you know, how we just commonly say, so, hey, how are you guys doing? Or you know, and, and we also, at, as, we, as, also talk, yeah. we also talk about how um, uh, a patriarchal white supremacist system actually has a built in panic defense for men who suddenly decide that they got scared. So they were allowed to kill somebody. I mean, what? <laughs> yeah. Like, again, you know, what day is it? Oh, it's the day that we smash the patriarchy. Yeah, we can smash the hell out of that anytime now because that is ridiculous. And it's been used for years. There's a long history of it. If you remember the Jenny Jones case that happened in the early 90s, it was used as a defense in that as well. Um, Brandon Tina case, like these are not appropriate things to, uh, to be happening to people anymore. Not at all, not at all. This, the, the, the leeway that uh, patriarchal culture gives to angry males is unbelievable. But that's a conversation for every day and you know, yeah. So where do we go from here? Well, I guess, you know, Cynthia, you are starting it, you know, by educating people. I really appreciated Cynthia's uh, voicing that because I personally have never even thought of it. And I have friends who are transgender and I never thought that it would be uh, insensitive of me to, like, I just think of them as girls. Like, I don't, like, they are women. So I've never, I, I'm so sorry, I've never thought of that. So thank you. I will be more careful. Yeah, and it was really just to demonstrate Linda's point that we're capable of change. Um, and it was just that what's the imperative change? And yes, I am so open because I have the privilege to be that open. Not, not everyone does. And so that's me recognizing my own privilege in society to exist and be comfortable enough putting myself out there and sharing stories and educating others in order to help it. Because if I can change it for the next generation mm -hmm. and the youth, I mean, the youth, oh my gosh, our youth are, they're brilliant. And we talked about this, I think last week, right? To me, they are, they're not the leaders of tomorrow. They're the leaders today. And we just need to step back, support them, and allow them to be the leaders that they are, they are already getting so many things right. And this conversation is one aspect they're getting right. They are very aware of it. They're very in tune with it. And we are capable of changing and growing. So. Yeah. Well, that's a, a really good segue into, I wanted to talk to you is like, you know what, there is a real growing crisis on, on the students. Um, you know, right down our schools are, are in a lockdown. Who knows 
I, it could be extended till the end of the year, we don't know. Um, teachers are at their wits end, parents too. Um, but it's, you know, it was interesting, the students though are, are really kind of feeling it and there are a lot of them that are afraid that they're falling behind and, you know, and even what will education look like for them? Are they going to have to repeat a year again? And that's putting on more stress, um, especially on the kids. And uh, yeah, so I don't know, um, you know, Kirsten and, and Robin, maybe go to you. Um, have you seen a growing amount of, of uh, young people? Well, I guess, Kristen, for you, it'd be families, right? Now come <laughs> living back into this virtual classroom. Yeah, yeah I mean, for, for some families and some young people, you know, online learning and being at home and, and that, that piece of isolation actually is, is working for them, believe it or not. And that's, you know, not to speak out of turn, but I, I think that's more typical with kids that weren't as comfortable in that that big high school setting and kids that struggled perhaps with a little anxiety. And so so they are like, I want to, you know, I, I'm hearing some are doing really, really well. And, and I'm hearing like equal on the other side that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of young people who are really struggling with, with connection. And to me, that would make thinking back in time for myself, that would have been something that was hard. I, I still get fueled and, and energized by connecting with folks. So um, that's that's hard and um, yeah you know it's interesting because I reached out to um, uh, Dr. Kathy Moser yesterday regarding a family I'm working with and they are like beyond swamped like um, you know they're really really seeing a huge influx of uh, families looking for services and um, uh, like never before and yeah I, I think it's absolutely it's struggling and you know there's different layers to that too I mean the children for sure are struggling with, with lack of connection being at home, but then it's the anxiety and what the, the parents bring into the whole mix of the family unit because, oh my gosh, especially I, I feel, especially females, when you have younger children. Um, so you're trying to perhaps hold down a, a full-time job, perhaps you're a teacher or a nurse or, or whatever profession it is, and you're trying to uh, be uh, on top of your family, making sure they're, first of all, staying safe, and well, mm -hmm. second of all, uh, keeping up and doing uh, online school. Um, and and I, I can't imagine being in that position. Um, there's a, a, a family um, that I'm working with, a, a mom who's a teacher and doing her absolute best to manage what's happening at the high school that she's teaching with. And she's really committed to her students. She's one of those teachers that goes above and beyond. And then back at home, she has uh, a teenager that's really struggling with some, some concerning issues uh, regarding their mental health, and she's trying to support them at home. She doesn't have the option to work at home. She doesn't have the option to go remote, mm -hmm. and she's trying to keep herself safe. Um, I think we, we, need to, uh, we need to really you know, pause and think of um, you know, those, those families and all the layers that are involved in perhaps how those those children are struggling with around them. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad I do not have <laughs> young children uh, during this time. Like I'm, I'm really, really, really thankful because I would be, uh, I, I know I would be having a hard time. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. So I got um, Susie and, and Linda and, and Sue, they can all join in because you all still have school age kids and they're all back at home, Susie. Oh. Ah, mute button, sorry. <laughs> yeah, they sure are. Good times, yeah. But at the same time, I also have my two uh, oldest and middle are booked for their vaccinations on Friday. So that's, so that's been a huge relief. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't have a lot of hope necessarily that they're going to be going back um, anytime soon. My preference would be that until all kids are vaccinated, we don't necessarily send them back into the fray. Um, and I realize that that comes with, again, a ton of, you know, privilege and opportunity. Um, cause some parents are not experiencing an easy time. Some kids are not experiencing an easy time at all. Their days are more or mornings are filled with tears while they're trying to connect with zoom or get Wi-Fi to work or get, you know, technology to work. So it's not, a, it's not a fun time. It's not a pleasant time. And, uh, I keep waiting for the articles that ask, you know, what are working dads doing? And yet they seem to be completely missing from this narrative. So, yeah. 
Here we are again. Yeah. yeah. I, just want, I just want to say there was a friend of mine who, um, so I think there are some dads who are like a stepping up, a friend of mine, they both could be or are considered essential workers. Both of them could work from home technically in their jobs. And um, last year it was, you know, the wife that stayed at home. And when I asked her, oh, are you going to be staying at home again? She went, I am still completely traumatized from last year. And I said, no. And my husband is stepping up and he calls during the day and go, where's the password for the parent portal? Where's this, where's that? And she said, but one of the things for her was, and, and I don't think we're recognizing it as much as we could thinking, and we talk about it, but are we doing anything? The trauma that has come about for like parents, like and kids, and thinking about kids too. I had a friend the other day, her kids have, they're in Ontario, her kids have been home for ages. And, and she said to him, why don't, you know, he's nine, why don't you go outside for a ride on your bike? Can I go outside? And she goes, yeah, like you can go for a ride on your bike, call a friend, go for a ride, wear your mask, socially distance. And he was like, but they keep telling us to stay away from people. And it's like, I think if I look back at my childhood, I probably hardly ever got close to people because I was on my bike or I was running around and fishing or like, you know, playing some stupid game of brandy in the streets, which I know is not always correct now. But like, I, th I think sometimes kids lost the art of playing outside mm -hmm. and now we're like, go and play. And they're like, um, what do you mean? Like, Oh, can't I just have them here playing some kind of game inside? And so I, I think there's a place about um, the messaging that we give that says, yeah, sometimes you can go outside and you can be a part and you can ride on opposite sides of the street with your masks on and you're okay. And I think those kind of connections, like, we're not necessarily teaching kids that they can still have those and be safe. And so we've got kids that are traumatized by that. And then we think about, uh, you know, my niece has a little fella and like, if he sees other people now, he's like, whoa, what's that? And so we are gonna have to look at all the traumas that come with this and we need to start thinking about it now. Mm -hmm. Like, what's that going to look like? You know, we I think we talked briefly last week about that yeah. reintegration bit. Yeah. Um, I think we really need to do more to look at how do we support parents, kids, community mm -hmm. as we start to step out again because people are going to step out in summer and... Yeah. Anyway, that's my two cents worth. Sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> well, we, we got to think of, you know, some more workshops that uh, Live Your Truth can run because I think we need to start this talk and I wanted to start it with education because we had started that talk last week saying that now is the time to raise our voices, have children also to have an input on what their education will be like in the future. And I see a lot of nodding heads, so I'm working on a special, so uh, I want, I'm going to send the invite to all of you ladies too. And Susie, you got to be there too. Because <laughs> obviously Rana said to me, well, it's not just writing a letter. We got to be more creative. So, um, but yeah, so, okay. So Linda, what, what, what? I said, <laughs> it was a good example right there because <laughs> my daughter who's 15 just came downstairs and she's, <laughs> it was actually really funny because she's like, okay, I have to be online in my entrepreneurship class, but my friend Val said she could come over uh, for an hour and we can socially distance and have a conversation and and can I do my class and, and have this kid over? So I'm going, I don't I don't know, like you, you're like, you, you're trying to make these decisions that you're like, I, I guess, is that okay? I don't know. I, and I'm weighing it out going, okay, her online class, which is important, but 
friendship and connection is crucial right now. So I'm like, I guess so. Maybe you guys could do the class together. Like, I don't know. So it's, it's, uh, we're, we're all definitely facing, you know, decisions on a regular basis that are, um, just ones that we haven't thought of before. And we're, we're all, you know, it's messy. It's it, that's what I'm finding right now. It's messy. There's no straightforward guidelines. We all have to learn to think on our feet, make decisions constantly, um, which I think adds to fatigue, uh, you know, and adds to that feeling of overwhelm and exhaustion. Because when you are making new decisions constantly, your brain gets tired. You do actually have decision fatigue at the end of the day if you're con constantly going, oh, you know, okay, that's a new decision. I don't know the answer to that one. That's another one. That's another one. So I think it's it's all kind of creating that sense of overwhelm. Um, but you know what? I'm extremely fortunate. You know, I my kids are, you know, teenagers. They're you know they they're pretty independent. You know, so we're definitely you know we do not have the struggles that other families do ha don't have. So I'm I'm grateful for that. Um, but my my heart does go out to people who are more isolated, who don't have the computer equipment working, um, you know, who mm -hmm. don't have the connections. Um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's challenging. Yeah, right no, and Sue, you've got uh, Griffin too. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great nine, well, he's eight, nine, nine, he's nine. Grade three, fun, <laughs> all fun. <laughs> uh, and there he is in the background. <laughs> Hello. Oh, hello, Griff. <laughs> hello. Hello. Mike. Oh, yeah. It's it's all about being fluid, right? We're fluid now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know it, it's uh, it's such, I, you know what? In Cynthia too, uh, I I hear UK is on the brink of, of opening up, and but there's a, a little bit of a, a a scare, I guess, right now with a, a new variant and ah. Yeah. I, we just opened yesterday. Um, I actually was out at a restaurant. It was amazing. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, the Indian variant is going ballistic here. It's gone eightfold in five days. Um, I think there's 4,000 cases or something in the country. So 400 in the city of London alone. Um, yeah, um, it could completely derail everything. But yeah. <sighs> So, so mental health is a little bit uh, dicey too, right? I mean, how do you, if you go down into another lockdown? Right. Yeah. How, does, is there, at some point, is there not a sense of just futility? I don't know. I'm, sometimes I feel like well, it because I'm kind of thinking we're not, right. uh, May 30th is going to come and they're going to say, okay, we're going to shut her down and for another two weeks because the caseloads aren't there, whatever. You know what? It's it came to me as as Linda was talking, and I put it in the chat, and it it hit me. Honestly, this was an aha moment for me, and it was like, oh my gosh, this idea that Linda talked about of you know having to constantly worry about and you know check the environment and make all these decisions. Well, that sounds to me like a marginalized person who's having to constantly scan their environment. Um, and obviously, from my background working with the two SLGBTQIA plus community, and it's like welcome to like being outed every time. And that is the anxiety that we live with all the time. And and kind of where our mind goes is like the story that I shared earlier. So for me, it it's a version of living that over and over and over. And I've just become very resilient because I've had to to live. Um, and as you know, I, I have a couple of philosophies that I live by life. And, and one is that you need to live your life like a clock. A clock knows that we have history. It has a past, but we can't go back to it. So a clock's function is to move forward through time. And we need to live our life like a clock and figure out how to move forward through time. And so that's what I do every day is I try and figure it out. Hmm. Now, Cynthia, did you always have this? Like, were you always like, because you, you're so, you're very strong in, in 
uh -huh. resilience and you know and you, and the way that now that you uh, you manage your business and what you talk yeah. about I kind of want to say you're born with it <laughs> um, you wouldn't think that if you had met me before and I certainly don't think I'm the person I was before um, but you know I have my moments uh, it's mm -hmm. I ended up meeting um, a family member we'll just leave it at that um, and I, we had an amazing visit, first time we ever met, and I spent the rest of the day crying. So I had my moments, mm -hmm. and life just gets so overwhelming. I was on the train heading back to my town, and I was bawling on the train the whole way because I was just so overwhelmed. So you can look strong, act strong, but you know we just have to be resilient and be like a clock. And that's what gets me through every day. That's what gets me up, makes my bed. And yeah, just try and find something to move us forward. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're I always, agree with you. go ahead. And I also think that in today's world, it's okay to be scared and it's okay to cry and it's okay to yell and it's okay for the kids to do it. That's where we are. <laughs> oh, yes, no doubt. Oh, uh, Susie, I was going to ask you to, I mean, it's been in the news, and um, I was hoping Rana was going to join us today, but um, I guess she has other businesses, uh, business, but uh, um, the rally this weekend, I guess, turned a little ugly. Um, the protesting and I was just wondering because we see it on the news and um, how do you explain it to the kids or is it anything that you have to you know, explain? I myself uh, I myself don't even know how to explain it and uh, yeah I, I, w I wish uh, Rana um, were here to give her her perspective and um, opinion but there's no way I feel qualified to even have an opinion on uh, on that struggle. Um, and you know, the bottom line is that whenever whenever people are dying or hurt, mm -hmm. my heart just breaks. And I don't know enough about that situation to be informed on what it is. And I'm trying to. I'm looking at some resources online and listening to um, listening to my friends who are out there and uh, and have you know family members living there and what they're experiencing. And I don't pretend to know anything more than those people who are who are living there who have lived there. But. Mm -hmm. We lost you, Susie. My heart is the people who are, uh, my heart is just with those who are struggling and, uh, and so, uh, and then suffering in this situation. Yeah, it's pretty, does anybody else have anything? I, 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 just, I you know, just saw some of the clips and video clips from um, what the rally or whatever, the protest on Saturday. And there's some that was just, ugly just if we look at human beings treating other human human beings uh, I, are, yeah. are, are we talking about the israeli palestine yes. conflict yes. Oh, okay it, what i find interesting is that we didn't name it <laughs> and you know it's something that i'm i've become very aware of myself in this past uh couple of weeks while the um israeli palestine conflict is is very uh, much in the news it's mm -hmm. in all over social media and i'm aware that i don't i i mean i i think i posted a couple things I, I, you know shared a couple of stories but i i would say when the black lives matter movement happened last year mm -hmm. i was very uh quick to learn uh, better use of language, kind of like what we were talking about today with pronouns, um, uh, gender. Uh, it was something that I immediately put my mind to and I put my brain on understanding white privilege. I looked at language. I looked at the consequences of uh, 
privilege, what I could do. There's something that is not the same about this conflict that I'm noticing the influencers that I follow on social media that I admire, I, I'm behind. I, I look to them for guidance. I look to them for language. I look for them to them for knowledge. They're not offering the same guidance. They're not speaking up in the same way. And I'm finding myself a little bit going, okay, I don't know what to say. I don't know where I'm supposed to look for uh, reputable resources. It's, 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 it's fascinating to me. And I don't know if anyone else is having that same experience of just really feeling um, that I don't have, as, as Susie said, I don't feel like I have enough to say, but I don't want to use that excuse as not saying anything because mm -hmm. silence is complicit uh, in, in this. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm finding I, there's, there's something, um, there's something there that I'm not quite seeing globally that I wish that I had better resources to understand it myself. And I don't know if anyone else is feeling that, but that's how I feel about it. Yeah. Linda, you're absolutely not alone. I was having a, a chat on the weekend with my kids. They, they have very strong opinions one particular way and I'm teaching acceptance without understanding. I, I definitely don't understand. And all I can do is accept that there are these groups that see the world completely differently. And, and you're right, if we're absolutely silent, we are complicit. If, if there's nothing we have learned from Black Lives Matter, it is that, but it is that in everything that comes up. No opinion is to dissent your opinion, right? Rightly or wrongly to the loudest voice, the squeakiest wheel. So um, I, you're not alone. And I'm just saying, I need to accept that this is their belief that they each see the world completely differently. And for me, when I see something, acceptance without understanding teaches me that I choose that I either need it in my life or I need to distance myself if I'm not because of its direct effects on me. And because I can't change the mind. In fact, you never can change someone else's mind. You know that, right? So um, it's simply to say, I, I, I get that. And I know that there is so much polarization. Um, the right answer is for both of them to stop, but neither seems to want to and neither thinks they should do it first. So what do you do? Hmm. I really appreciate you saying that, Cynthia, that acceptance without understanding, because I think when I hear you say that last year with the Black Lives Matter movement, it was black and white for me anyway. There was a clear like right and wrong. And I knew that I, I, I could see it. I could trust it. I, and that's as humans, we crave that black and white. We crave having the right or wrong. The, the gray middle messy ground is anxiety provoking for a lot of us. And that's where that fear of I'm going to get this wrong is. So I'm not going to say anything. Right. And for me that the um, Israeli Palestine conflict is not black and white. And that's what people, you know, the readers, the people that I've been following who I admire, they're the first to say, it's not, it's not an easy thing to understand. And so I really love that acceptance without understanding. That's so beautiful and key. Cynthia, I want to, sorry, I just keep on. Um, if we look at, like in, in your, I'm going to say in your backyard in, in England and with Ireland, mm -hmm. and you know, the IRA bombings, you know, and Belfast and everything, not to say that's the same thing, but again, right, that was conflict for a long time. And how is it now? Is it, you know, is it okay or... Is it still no. there? No, I mean, it's definitely there. And Brexit has made it worse. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm, I'm struggling because I want to share a story, but I'm also conscious of time. Because no, okay. being here has fundamentally changed my perception. So for those that don't know, I was born and raised for the first six years of my life in Belfast, Northern Ireland. In 1972, three men in black masks came to my parents' door and threatened their life because my father was English. He did not follow the line of who he's supposed to be friends with. And so 30 days later, I was living in Canada. I call that my first transition in life. So the reality is, I always thought it was the IRA were the ones that made us move. Growing up, I badmouthed the IRA. I was an Irish Protestant, except when I got married, I became Roman Catholic. Now I'm neither. So I've kind of been through this cycle and yet now I'm here and it's the unionists, the trade, you know, the, the Protestant faction which seem to be causing all the grief because they think they're losing that part of Northern Ireland that's part of the UK and they want to be annexed into and so that's where the troubles are primarily flaring up, at least as per the news, primarily the BBC that I see. But it's really called into question who actually made my parents leave, who threatened them. And I don't think it's the IRA anymore. And that, I mean, that is a real mind shift to try and get through your head of what group that you thought you were aligned to, but actually alienated you when you were six years old. And I'm having to be processing that kind of in the current sphere. So. Wow, that's really very interesting. And you're still trying to figure that out too, right? Yeah, well, I don't think I'll ever know the real answer of, of who threatened my parents, but it's becoming to me more and more clear the the evidence of where it points to be and kind of the position that people are taking. Wow. I'm drawing conclusions from people's behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now you they all become a detective too. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is turning into a movie. Yeah. Well, we have a oh. movie producer right yeah. there, at Sue. Okay, are you taking this yeah. all in? I mean, oh gosh. I mean, yeah, yeah Cynthia's yeah. life should be a film it should be yeah we'll call it finding me <laughs> oh this is so fabulous well i mean so i'm going to give it now to robin because you've been sitting there and and listening to all of this Boop. no um but you know even getting back now i guess to talking about the kids um what what can we do? I, I mean, and I'm not talking for myself, but you know, because we're hearing of just again, you know, the stories of pe of parents, right, struggling, kids struggling. Um, you know, you had mentioned, yeah, just let your kid go out and play, or maybe it's like what Linda's doing. Maybe just let your, you know, your your daughter have her friend over and social distance and do class together. Um, yeah, yeah, like, I guess, I don't know if I have the answers, right? I'm, uh, you know, I'm one of those rule followers at the moment. So what can I do to stay within the edges of the rules? I can get kids outside when they social distance. Um, I can keep in conversation with kids to find out what's happening for them and not be judgmental if they're losing their shit. And they're going, I've had enough of this because I do that too. And I think, you know, and, and I want to be clear, I, I was a step parent and probably still am, but we, I lived with someone when he was a 10 to 17 and I have lots of nephews and nieces, but I'm not currently dealing with kids in this crisis, right? All I can say is, that from my experience and talking to kids and talking to adults, if we can be real and we can share what we're going through too, not in the, oh my God, I'm going through that too, but in the let's have real, open, honest conversations um, about what's happening and how it feels and connecting at that level. And I think, you know, I've watched people, I want to protect my kids from this or I want to protect them from how I'm feeling and it really runs along the same lines as sometimes we want to like 
protect the poor person with the mental health issue because we don't think they can cope or they're going to be triggered. And I think people do the same kind of thing with kids. And for me, I'm like, let's be real and let's have those real conversations and not think our kids are fragile or can't handle it or are going to lose it if we talk about this. Because that, to me, Linda asked before what builds resilience. I think real conversations and real emotions and being able to be with them and talk about them and work out ways through them is about how resilience is built, whatever that looks like for each individual, because it's so in different, right? But if we don't start doing that, what are we creating? This, like, we don't create the ability for people to go through difficult moments. Kirsten and I were just talking earlier today about we try and protect, we try and fix, we try and solve. And really what we want to do is create community from doctor like 105 that actually have it in here and know they have it. And when we keep trying to not have those conversations or not be real, then what we create is people that can't deal with difficult moments. And all of a sudden something happens and they're like, it's a crisis. It's an emergency instead of, Oh, yeah, sometimes it gets to that point, but but difficult moments are part of life. And being able to sit with uncomfortable feelings is something, um, although it's difficult, is all about learning and growing. And I hope that we teach everyone that, not just our kids, but, but yeah, that's me. Mm. Those are, I mean, and you're right, because if we don't start doing this now, you are going to be inundated with people in crisis mode, you and Kirsten and Charlotte. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Isn't that when I become super wealthy? No. <laughs> oh, we have this business model where we give away more than we earn. So you know, I, I think we have the capacity mm -hmm. um, as like people in whatever field we're in, wherever we are having these conversations to create spaces that people can have real conversations. And if we don't have real ones, then we don't support people to be able to get through tough times like this. Because mm -hmm. stuff happens in life. And like, if we keep protecting and like, Oh, I'm not going to say that because someone might like they're fragile or I don't want them to have to deal with that then we create people who can't deal with the ability to pivot and like I hate that term pivot but be flexible and be okay with not being okay and have tougher conversations and sit with their own discomfort so I just encourage people to let's get real like let's stop pretending because it's not okay half the time, or maybe more than half for some people. And it's okay to say it's not. doesn't mean we stay in that place, but yeah. If we don't name it, how do we deal with it? Well, you're certainly right. Linda? Somebody said that to me the other day, uh, name it to tame it. Oh. And... Uh, I, you know, I, 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 I love that, that that's you, if you name something, you can take all of its power uh, away from affecting you as much, you know, you, you really do have to name it and look at it. And I agree with you, Robin, just have real conversations. And that is, um, that, that's, you know, I started that with my kids, um, I think my youngest was about seven and I realized um, that I had been parenting her wrong <laughs> for about seven years. I was, you know, a very compassionate person and very much wanting to protect and comfort and shield. And that was kind of how I was operating. And it, there was a bit of an aha moment when I went, oh, no, <laughs> this is not, this is not going to get any good results here. 
And I, I had to, at that point, pivot very dramatically and became a parent that I needed to be, like how I needed to be parented when I was young. I was treated very fragilely when I was young and it did not serve me well. I did not have the tools when shit came up to deal with it. And I realized that I was replicating that same pattern and I stopped myself and started to become, I'm sure my kids were like, what is going on <laughs> with our mother? Because I just went, one day went, <laughs> no, things are changing. And thank God it, it really, it was a, a such a, a shift in our household. They were finally, you know, given much more boundaries, much more tools for dealing with things that came up. And I agree with Robin, 50% of life is crappy. It's always going to be that way. It's never going to be, you know, 100% sunshine and roses. It's always going to be 50-50. And, you know, getting stronger to learn, as Cynthia said, that building that resilience, um, living forward. What did you say? Living forward through time. I want that tattooed on my body. I love that. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, giving those tools to our kids letting them know yeah half of life is going to be uh live your life like a clock oh that's your autobiography's name yes love that okay i'm i'm seeing <laughs> I, I could go on so anyway I, i've enjoyed this conversation thank you so much everyone um uh thank you tracy as always for hosting this is just uh one of my favorite parts of my week Ah, uh, well, no, it's, I think, a lot of our favorite part, too, because it's not only that I can see everybody, but it's, you know, it's, hey, it's, we're talking about real things, and and I, I want to know, too, how to navigate re-entry. What's that going to look like? I mean, you know, because there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There will, there is, and, uh, you know, Cynthia is now living, living part of it, hopefully, um, you know, and, but who knows? I think, you know, we're going to be riding this wave and it's going to be ups and downs for another year at least. So, but we'll all have each other. Um, Susan, I was just going to ask you lastly, have you had any interesting conversations now with Griffin? Oh, always. We have interesting conversations <laughs> every day. <laughs> no, he's a cracker. He's, uh, yeah, he brings up, throws anything out. And how is he with like, back to you about the vaccination? Why is the age only 12? Oh. <laughs> and if it becomes younger, can I have a vaccination? Can I play with my friends when I have, I mean, they still play, but they do the masks and, mm -hmm. you know, they socialize and I think it's important. And they know that for them, this is their reality. They don't question that it's, the reality right now, which is amazing. Whereas we're going, when did his mask go off? When, when are we back to normal? And they're going, eh, you know. So I, I live through his resilience. That's, he's good. Uh, well, sometimes, yeah, you know, kids are, kids say the darndest things sometimes. <laughs> he keeps me honest. Let's put it that way. Oh, yes. Well, anyways, Thanks again so much, everyone, for another great, great conversation. And I know, you know, the weeks will continue on and we'll, we'll figure things out. But uh, have a great week, everybody. Enjoy the Tuesday. It's supposed to be rain for the next, I guess, rest of the week. But we do need rain. We do need rain here. Okay, so have a wonderful Tuesday. Oh, and I'll see you tomorrow night, Cynthia. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tracy. Bye-bye.